Prairie Yard and Garden is a production of the University of Minnesota Morris in cooperation with Pioneer Public Television. Closed captioning is provided by Mark and Margaret Yankel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. Shalom Hill Farm. Shalomhill.org. We all need some privacy around our homes. One of the best ways to find that privacy is with hedges. There are many plant options to fit our individual needs. Join me on Prairie Yard and Garden as we discover shapes, texture, and heights that hedges can provide to give us our secluded spaces. Mankind has been defining their spaces for centuries with stones, walls, and plants. Today we're going to look at the many options homeowners have in using hedges. My guest is Jeff Johnson with the University of Minnesota Landscape Arboretum and manages the woody plants. Jeff, welcome to Prairie Yard and Garden. Thank you. It's good to be here. Tell me, how long has this hedge display been around? Well, it's been here longer than I've been here. It was quite well established in 1986 when I first started at the Arboretum. And so my estimate is that it was uh, established in the late 60s or early 70s. How many different types of hedges do you think are here? My estimate is about 65 different plant material that we have sheared into hedges of different forms. Well, that's a lot of options for the public. Certainly, that's what we're here to provide is uh, see what's possible and uh, how to do it uh, properly at the Arboretum. So where do we begin if we're talking about hedges? How do we make selections? I guess we all have our own favorite plants and anything deciduous pretty much, or coniferous for that matter really, uh, any woody plant can be made into a hedge if you want to put in enough effort. Uh, the real uh, issue is how uh, large do you want it to get uh, when it's mature and th there are only certain limitations uh, that you can do with uh, larger plant material to keep them smaller for longer periods of time. So if you want something a little smaller you need to pick a plant that has a mature size that's a little bit smaller. Then where would we put a hedge in our home? Ideally uh, full sun is the best. Uh, very few things do better in shade. The one exception to that is uh, is use and uh, uh, even they can tolerate a lot of sun but uh, they prefer shade so that's really the one exception in this uh, part of the country that that uh, prefers shade everything else really uh, does much better in full sun to part shade and as I look around the yard how would I utilize a hedge what is its real purpose well, it can be a lot of different uh, things. Uh, it could be uh, something as formal as a knot garden or a formal uh, border around a vegetable garden or something like that to really give it an accent and uh, uh, define a space. Um, you could put it in uh, along a border to uh, shield or block um, uh, neighbors, uh, establish privacy. Um, you could use them uh, for things like uh, uh, weather issues, um, conservation issues, using plant materials to conserve energy in your home, uh, planting a large hedge on the uh, northwest side of your home, uh, the prevailing winds from that direction. So lots of different reasons to uh, plant uh, hedges in your yard. How do we maintain a good healthy hedge? One of the keys uh, whenever we're talking about any kind of a real dividing uh, uh, break uh, with plant materials, uh, it could be a formal or informal hedge, uh, is to try and keep the widest part of the plant closest to the ground and then taper in from there rather than having them vertical or even worse having the top of the plant being wider than the bottom 
Uh, the plant needs to be able to feed itself, and they feed themselves through leaves, uh, with sunlight, and when you have the lower parts of the plant um, shaded, those parts can't grow as vigorously as the top, and therefore you get a kind of a, a feedback system that perpetuates itself. And so you really need to keep the top of the plant in and the widest part of the plant near the ground, and then taper it in from there. So uh, that's really one of the keys in, uh, in maintaining uh, woody plant materials in general. Um, if the material gets out of hand, what is our option? Well, we have lots of different options. Uh, depending on the kind of plant material you're dealing with and whether it will rejuvenate itself from severe pruning. Um, evergreens, for the most part, uh, things like arborvitae and junipers, uh, pine, spruce, fir, etc., uh, will not generate new wood off of that old blank wood, we call it. And uh, so there's really no option then other than to cut it down and replace it. Uh, other options on things like um, honeysuckle or privet or alpine currant, um, you have lots of more options. You can actually just cut those right down to the ground, uh, nearly as close to the ground as you can get, and they will sprout back from the, uh, the roots and the small portions of stem that are left. We call those adventitious growth, and uh, you can renew the plant uh, quite easily that way. Uh, we can do, actually do that about once every three to five years, depending on the plant. In fact, uh, one of the plants here, uh, right at the entrance to the arboretum, right near the gatehouse, some lilacs have gotten old and very woody and kind of weak. And uh, we've done this before in the past, uh, about 10 years ago. Go in and chainsaw them down. Uh, they'll re-sprout and uh, produce really nice uh, foliage next year and then flowers a couple of years down the road from that. So. Uh, renewal pruning is uh, one of the tools that we have in our arsenal of tools. I would suspect that we have a number of hedges that do blossom, and is there a concern there of when we might do some pruning? Oh, certainly. Uh, you can, as I said, uh, make a hedge out of just about anything, uh, including things like lilacs, uh, but you do have to uh, realize that uh, some of your flowering may be lost because of the shearing process. Lilacs are old wood blooming plants, so they, uh, you know, it's the beginning of September here. Uh, they've pretty much set up their flowers for next spring. So anything we uh, take off late in the summer and early fall, um, we're taking off a lot of flower buds. There may be flower buds down in the, in the uh, axles of the plant more that could sprout up, uh, and we would certainly allow those to bloom, uh, and then start shearing them in the, in the uh, late spring, early summer. Uh, something like this spirea here uh, that uh, blooms on new wood, uh, we don't have to worry about that nearly as much. We can take these down really hard uh, on a fairly regular basis. Actually, some of the spirea here at the Arboretum we, t we renew pretty much every year. We just kind of chop it down into a kind of a helmet pattern and it regrows and uh, uh, blooms on new wood or that current season's growth. So, and then uh, through the shearing process, you're actually deadheading it to a certain degree, and therefore you can get more blooming through the growing season that way with some of these plants that bloom on new wood. What's some of the general recommendations for maintaining a good quality hedge? Well, aside from pruning, uh, we really encourage uh, people to give uh, any woody plant uh, water, especially during dry uh, periods. Uh, you know, anything over a week or two weeks of uh, dry weather, uh, woody plants are going to really benefit just like your annuals and perennials from a little extra water. You know, the big difference between a prairie and a forested area is rainfall. That's the one big determination. And uh, so any of these plants have evolved, uh, that are woody plants, uh, have evolved in uh, more precipitation. Uh, so. You know, give them an inch of water uh, per week, approximately, um, but don't overwater them. Sometimes we uh, see homeowners uh, killing plants with uh, too much love, and they uh, overwater things, particularly newly planted material. So what we encourage people to do is just do the finger test. Uh, go out and sample the soil under your plant or just right around the plant and see if it feels moist and cool. 
If it does, leave it alone for another few days to a week and then check it again. And then uh, if it feels dry, um, give it a shot of water. A uh, good uh, way to do that is just allow your hose to trickle uh, next to a plant uh, for an hour or so and really soak the uh, soil thoroughly and then don't water it for a period of time again. Again, uh, killing it with love, uh, you can over um, water by watering too frequently as well. So some of the other things we do, uh, we, the area we stand in right now uh, was just fertilized this morning with uh, um, probably ammonium sulfate uh, fertilizer. It's just a ch cheap form of nitrogen and uh, that's the primary nutrient that's lacking usually in plant growth. Uh, phosphate and uh, uh, potassium really aren't recommended anymore at all, uh, especially in Minnesota soils, um, unless you're going in and, and adding it to the subsoil. So nitrogen fertilizer, uh, about a pound, a pound and a half per thousand square feet of actual nitrogen, uh, depending on the formulation. Uh, so we're putting about, uh, with uh, ammonium sulfate, that's uh, 3300. So we're putting on about three pounds of fertilizer uh, per thousand square feet gives you a pound of nitrogen. Uh, one spring application and one uh, mid-fall application uh, is, is a good strategy. And again, about a pound, pound and a half is a really good, safe, uh, yet uh, effective uh, dose of fertilizer. Uh, some of the other things we uh, deal with are mildew issues, uh, some disease issues with uh, things like fire blight on some of the rose species, uh, particularly things like ketoniaster. We do have uh, some yellows diseases in some of the lilacs, uh, particularly some of the Preston type lilacs where uh, it's a uh, phytoplasma like organism, kind of getting into more technical stuff, but uh, we also have uh, issues with uh, mildew that can defoliate the plants, uh, some of the leaf spot diseases, uh, you know, black spot or whatever, uh, can defoliate the plants, especially this time of the year. So um, normally that doesn't kill the plant. It doesn't kill the plant. It's just a, uh, looks ugly late in the season, and then next year, depending on the spring and early summer weather, uh, we will or will not have an infection of that whatever disease that defoliates it at that point in time. The other thing uh, most of our viewers would probably ask is there are uh, insect problems associated with hedges in general? Um, you can get uh, some outbreaks of uh, spider mites and um, of course there's uh, Japanese beetles. Uh, we kind of do that on a case-by-case -case basis, so just inspecting your plant material on a fairly regular basis is uh, important. Um, I do not have a good solution. We have Japanese beetle here at the Arboretum. Uh, nobody has a great solution to that. Uh, the joke is that you buy a trap and then you give it to your neighbor. So the insects are attracted to their yard rather than your yard. So, you know, depending on how your relationship is with your neighbor. Right. Um, but uh, no, there's no great solution for that. Uh, mites and aphids uh, can be uh, perpetuated with this very close uh, um, uh, shearing process that we do in hedges. Uh, and so we just inspect, and if it has a problem, then we treat it. Can we go take a look at maybe a few hedges you'd recommend for homeowners to put in their yard? I'd be happy to. So what we're looking for are things that, uh, generally speaking, are lower growing, you know, under three to four feet tall, uh, that can be sheared into a hedge. And uh, if you're looking for something like that, and looking for low maintenance in particular, and most people are looking for something lower maintenance, so you define the height of the plant, uh, you might add a foot or so to that, and then look at things in catalogs that have a mature height around that same height. So with this barberry, for example, this has a, a mature height of around four feet, and this shears really nicely and re really well into about a two and a half to three foot hedge. Uh, really nice and tight, uh, relatively square, very formal. Uh, you could informalize it a little bit by just uh, allowing the uh, top to be a little bit more round, um, but uh, this makes a very nice hedge. 
Uh, some of the other things that make uh, excellent uh, short hedges, uh, the, the japonica and the bumalda type spireas. The spireas that bloom on new wood, uh, generally speaking, stay under about three or four feet tall. Uh, the old wood blooming plants uh, like Van Hootii tend to get quite, quite a bit larger and so you wouldn't want to select that if you're looking for a smaller, shorter hedge. Another uh, really good plant that I like to uh, favor uh, that happens to be one of our good natives, really tough plant, is Potentilla, uh, the Potentilla fruticosa. Uh, lots of different cultivars out there, but generally speaking, they're fairly low growing, make a very nice little hedge, uh, under two feet tall. Uh, shear really well, uh, they accept uh, renewal pruning uh, very well. You can cut them back hard uh, year after year and they re-sprout, they bloom on new wood. Uh, and you still will have some residual flowering even if you do shear them quite hard. Is this the uh, potentilla that I can buy at a nursery that got the yellow blossoms? Uh, there's lots of different uh, colors these days. Uh, primarily yellow, but there are some whites as well. Yep. So d lots of different cultivars out there that uh, someone discovered a new, new plant from a uh, seedling or whatever and uh, put a name on it and threw it out into the nursery and uh, nursery people picked it up. So uh, many, many different plants are like that. Uh, some of the other plants that uh, people typically don't think of as a low-growing plant, um, arborvitae. There's quite a few different cultivars of arborvitae that are asexually or, or vegetatively propagated, uh, cloned if you will, and uh, they're quite low-growing. Uh, Mr. Bowling Ball is one of them. Uh, it only gets to be about two, two and a half feet tall. Uh, if you plant a whole bunch of those in a row, uh, shear them a little bit, it makes a very, very nice little hedge for you. Well, let's go take a look at some of the tall hedges that we might use as a windbreak effect or a, a privacy fit. Sounds good. Well, what we have here is uh, something that normally would get to be, uh, you know, 30 to 40 feet tall, and we're turning it into a hedge that's going to be maintained uh, for as long as possible, somewhere between 6 feet and 12 feet tall. Um, after about 12 feet, then it gets to be too ungainly, and we'll probably end up uh, doing the same process we've done here. Uh, we used to have a big old uh, spruce hedge here, and um, it just got to be too large to maintain. Uh, with the equipment that we have, so we took it out and replanted it with these spruce trees. And these are just regular old spruce trees that we got uh, in container from a local nursery, uh, seed grown, so they're on their own roots, and uh, that makes them a lot cheaper that way as well. And then we allowed them to grow up to a few feet tall, and then I came out because the person who actually does the maintenance in this area um, couldn't quite bring herself to do it, but I lopped the top of the plant off and then that caused the plant to sprout up more side branches and then we've been shearing this the past couple of years uh, while these plants are in their candle phase. These uh, spruce trees, uh, pines, firs, uh, Douglas firs all fall into the category of what we call determinate type growth of evergreens. So the growth is determined in the bud uh, this year for next spring's growth, and particularly in pines, they're very strongly determinate. Uh, spruce and fir are a little bit less, but uh, they get these candles on them, and that's the time of the year that you really want to shear them, and shear them hard. Uh, Two-thirds of the, the growth uh, taken off isn't too much. How do we define candle? Uh, candle is the soft tissue that's growing in the spring of the year. It's much, much softer than the older needles right now. Uh, and uh, it's the, the portion of the plant that's growing from the bud uh, next spring and early summer. So it'll be New Year's growth. New Year's growth, yep. So uh, shearing that off uh, allows for a couple things to happen. Uh, it uh, decreases the amount of growth that happens that year, and it also increases the number of uh, side buds on the branch down below where you've sheared, so that all those buds the next year after that will break and grow hopefully uh, and cause more densification and therefore more dwarfing of the plant. So we're going to shear these uh, hedges uh, over the next few years and even them out a little bit and uh, then um, 
It will be one big solid hedge, probably at about six feet tall, and then we'll allow for a couple inches of growth every year. And with these spruce, uh, these are quite disease resistant types of spruce versus the Colorado blues, which are the most uh, disease susceptible. These should retain four or five years worth of needles uh, pretty easily. And then, so they'll be nice and full. Uh, we'll keep the bottom, the widest portion, uh, shear them up and shear them moderately formally uh, into a square hedge. And uh, this will all be one very large uh, hedge here just out of these uh, spruce trees that normally would grow to be 30 feet tall or so. Well, that looks like it would be a tremendous windbreak. This is very thick. Uh, it is very thick. And uh, we typically see spruce trees in uh, uh, farm windbreaks, uh, you know, as an excellent uh, plant, um, just planting them out close enough so that the branches could grow together and allow them to grow up into uh, regular sized trees. We have a little bit different approach here. This isn't necessarily a windbreak per se, but more of an enclosure for the uh, hedge collection here. So kind of uh, defining the area. Uh, it would be a great uh, privacy uh, fence uh, around the property if you want to give it, uh, you know, six to eight feet of room in your yard. Um, but uh, really nice, uh, nice plant. This is one of the high recommended evergreens, uh, particularly for this area north and west of the Twin Cities. Well, what other plants would we consider that are going to be in that six to eight foot range? Uh, six to eight foot range, uh, when we've sheared them, uh, things like Technia brevitae, uh, it's one of the real popular cultivars. Uh, again, typically that plant will get to be about 20 feet tall, 25 feet, and maybe even 15 to 20 feet wide. Uh, they're large plants, but uh, you wouldn't really necessarily think of them like that in a container uh, when they've been sheared into these uh, four or five foot pyramids. But you plant them fairly close together, and then you shear them into a uh, hedge and allow them to grow together. Uh, over a number of years, you can create a very nice uh, taller hedge. Uh, some of the other things, uh, as I say, you can pretty much grow anything into a hedge. Uh, things like uh, amelanchier, the uh, shad blow service berries, um, viburnums, you can shear them into a hedge. Uh, any of those can be turned, you know, they're eight to 10 foot shrubs. Uh, you can turn them into a nice five, six, uh, seven, eight foot shrub, depending on, on what you wanna do. Uh, many of those plants also, if they do get to be too large for you over time, uh, you can renewal prune them really, really well. Uh, these spruce, arborvitae, uh, don't do uh, the renewal thing at all. So once you cut them down, they're done. Now, we would consider this a formal type hedge? Uh, it will be eventually. Right now, it looks a little bit less formal, uh, partly because of the uh, differential of these being grown from seedling, and we have some... Uh, genetic variation in the size and growth habit of these plants. But we're gonna kind of modify that with pruning over time and uh, even things out so that it will be a very formal looking hedge eventually. Probably a couple more years and it will look much, much more formal than it is now. Uh, can we go take a look at uh, what you might classify as informal? Oh, absolutely, one of my favorite plants, yep. Question. I have some very nice ornamental grasses. Should I be clipping them? Yes, once a year you need to cut your grasses back. I advise you to let your grasses grow all winter and enjoy their beauty in the winter, but in the early spring, just before they start to grow, you need to cut the plants back. So what happens if you don't cut your grass back at all is it looks half dead and half alive. So you need to cut off the previous year's growth because it not only looks better, the plants will grow quicker and they'll be much more healthy. So you need to cut your ornamental grasses back once a year in the late, late winter or very early spring. You can use an electric hedge trimmer, you can use a lawn mower, you can use hand uh, clippers, and for really large areas, some people do get a burn permit but that's the one thing you need to do every year on grasses is cut them back. Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chanhassen, dedicated to enriching lives through the appreciation and knowledge of plants.
Well, what we're uh, right uh, near right now is called uh, Divilla lanicera, or dwarf bush honeysuckle. And uh, this makes a very nice informal hedge, uh, planted fairly close together. Uh, these plants just kind of uh, funnel out and uh, fountain out, if you will, and make a very interesting, in my opinion, uh, uh, informal hedge. Uh, this is a native plant. Uh, it's got great wildlife potential with uh, flowers through the uh, summer and into fall. Uh, lots of uh, food for butterflies and other insects. Um, it does get a little bit of leaf spot. It has uh, some interesting fall color but not spectacular but uh, makes for a nice uh, informal hedge. Some of the other plants that you can use are any of those plants we already mentioned about things that are fairly low growing, uh, two to three feet, four feet tall, and just allow them to grow naturally. Uh, plant them close enough together and then uh, they will turn into a nice informal hedge. When you talk about planting close, what's the range that we're discussing? Uh, probably about uh, uh, half the uh, distance of their mature height is what would be my recommendation. So if we're talking about three feet tall, maybe a foot and a half apart or so. Uh, is a good recommendation. And that will give us this nice tight arrangement. Right. And these things uh, do uh, tend to spread a little bit, uh, particularly dwarf bush honeysuckle and many of the other shrubs. So they will spread a little bit and grow together in one big mass in a, in a column uh, into a hedge. Now, as I look at it, I'm just hearing a lot of people say, oh, that's kind of raggy looking. This could be sheared, but uh, we allow it to uh, grow this way just as kind of an example of what a less formal hedge can be, something that's appropriate in height and uh, width and things, and then we control it um, uh, through various cultural practices uh, as needed. Um, but kind of a informal, low maintenance uh, or, or near no maintenance. There's no such thing as a no maintenance plant in the landscape. Uh, this would benefit from watering. A little bit of weeding is required. Um, it does get a little bit of leaf spot, but it's almost insignificant. Um, the plant will be defoliated before the leaf spot ever really affects the plant's uh, appearance uh, overall. Well, Jeff, I want to take this opportunity to thank you for uh, informing us about the potential in hedges. My pleasure. It was great talking with you. Closed captioning is provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. Shalom Hill Farm. ShalomHill.org.